Well, Garrison Keillor talks about Lake Wobegon. He says, where the women are strong, the men are good looking and the children are above average. I have to tell you that here in Santa Clarita, our women are strong, they are good looking, and they are above average. All right? And one of the proofs of that is we just saw some of their offspring up here leading our music. Are they not the best looking children in California? <laughs> Pacific Union College was named best campus by U.S. News, was it News, Newsweek, I think it was, two years ago, and the best looking students. And I think if they toured Adventist churches and came to this one, they would say our young adults are the most handsome as well. Not to mention our campus, thank you all. It looks pretty good. So I just had to throw that out before we get to the biblical material this morning. Well, you can see from what was read to you a moment ago that we're all over the place. Our Proverbs give us the portrait of how to avoid temptation or evil sin, how to avoid adultery more explicitly is what some of that's about. And it talks about the teachings specifically of our parents and mentions in particular mother. And so I think uh, without going into too much detail in the obvious, what we see in our Proverbs is an admonition not to forget the teachings of mother and father. One of the things we forget very quickly, maybe it's our uh, adversity or our, I mean our ad adverseness to the idea of, of making idols of anything or anyone, but we forget that to our children up to a point in life, we are God. And this is very natural and normal. We uh, uh, created them, so to speak. And I'm not saying that in the big sense of the word as in capital C creator. I'm saying that in the small p sense of the word, in procreator, okay? So do, please don't think I'm being blasphemous here. We've given them life. We've given them sustenance and nourishment. We've provided all of their needs. We've in every way given them language, thought, culture. We've raised them from peas in a pod to human beings. Our mothers and our parents are our gods to us up into a certain age. And Proverbs wisely says, parents, you lay the foundation for your children. What you teach them now becomes what they're going to be later on. This is why, among other reasons, our, our teaching of our children is so emphasized and so important in this place. Why we have so many ministries oriented toward children. Why, parents, you have such an incredible responsibility to your little ones. And mothers, how your prayers... What you read to your children at night, what you say to them in the morning, makes all the difference in whom, whom they will become spiritually. So Proverbs lays that foundation for us. When we look at the wisdom and the value of parenthood and, and women in particular, mothers in particular, Proverbs speaks very plainly to that. A story you probably haven't heard comes to us from the book of Samuel. Now, I can only frame this in terms of the concerns of state. Very, it's, it's fuel and fodder for atheism otherwise in some respects. Let me explain that briefly. A lot of people look at the Bible and they say, really, that's what God said to do? Really, that's what God wanted? Really, God, God wanted gen genocide over here? He wanted this to happen? And all of a sudden, Christians are put on the defensive rather than the Bible being an inspired writing that teaches us something positive about God. We're left explaining how all kinds of awful things could be sanctioned in the context of the Old Testament. And so, while that is by no means an adequate explanation of this, this whole thing that uh, I'm describing, in the interest of being clear, I think the story is situated in a situation around state concerns. That is to say, David is king, head of the state of Israel such as it is, Israel Judah. And he is being faced with an insurrection by a Benjamite. Now, what tribe did the first king of Israel come from? I'm not hearing you. Benjamin, that would be correct. And what was his name? 
Saul, the Kishite. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, and one in the tribe, and, and, and Saul's son, Jonathan, was killed in battle and not his successor, and his other sons were not allowed to be his successor either. David from an entirely nether, other family and from an entirely other tribe was selected as king, was he not? And so now a Benjamite says, we have no part with David. We have no part with him, each to his own tent. Now that's strange talk to us today, but what it meant back then was, David's not our king, come follow me. David got wind of this, and an order, an executive order went out to squelch the insurrection. This could not be tolerated in the empire. They had suffered enough already, and the council of David's wise men who surrounded him, there weren't a lot of them, but the men who surrounded him said, look, this is going to be worse for you than what happened with your son Absalom. Get this taken care of. So the executive order goes out, okay, Joab, go after this guy. Joab is the head of the armed forces, and he's basically the head of the secret service. He's head of um, the TSA, he's head of the FBI, the CIA, he's head of the Mossad, if you will. He's head of everything that there is going on in the state at that particular time, and he takes it on personally. And so he gathers a group of men and they begin to pursue this insurrectionist, Sheba. And they chase him down to the city of Abel, this is one of the inherited cities. This is one of the ancient cities. And they build ramparts and fortifications and ramps and begin to, to lay siege to the city and to batter its walls. And a very wise woman, the scripture uses the word wise, sticks her head out from behind the wall and says, excuse me, I want to speak to Joab. What a strange request. And even stranger still, he agrees to speak to her. I don't understand this. It, it must have been a very small town. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how this works, that a woman of no name in Scripture gets to speak to the head of security, the chief of the army. I, I don't understand how that works. But Joab comes over, and she says, I want to speak to you. And he says, I'm listening. She says, listen carefully to what I have to tell you. Abel was one of those places where when people needed a spiritual answer, when they needed to seek the Lord, when they wanted a sign or counsel, they came here. We are one of the oldest cities in Israel. We are one of the places that has always been loyal to the true God and always been loyal to the king. And now you come and you would tear us down and destroy us? This catches him off guard. No, no, he says, I'm not here to ruin the place, but that's what he was doing. I've got a guy I've got to catch, and he's in your city. She says, what's the name? Tell me who this person is. He tells her, and she says, sometimes women have to be tough. Sometimes women have to be strong. Sometimes women have to be wise. And she's got a plan, and she says, tell me the name. And then you know what she says to Joab? We'll toss his head out to you over the wall. No equivocating. She's fully confident of her declaration. She knows what will happen to her if she fails. She has no doubt that she's going to be able to accomplish this. She goes to the people of the city. She says, we have a choice. We can take this guy, cut his head off, toss it over the wall, or we can lose our city, our homes, and our lives. What'll it be? Well, this was an easy decision for the city. This was something they had no question about. David, the king of Israel, has a fugitive he needs to get a hold of, an insurrectionist, something the state can't tolerate, and he is going to deal with it if they don't. And so they take Sheba and slice his head off and toss it over the wall to Joab. Mission accomplished. And the scripture calls her wise. I like it. 
I don't know if you like it. It's sufficient. It's, it's, uh, there's something about this story that's um, it's participatory. It gets the job done, and uh, there's a certain ruthless efficiency to it. Abel is spared. Her community is left intact. It remains one of the faithful in Israel. David's kingship is left intact. The Lord's anointed is not. Uh, no hand goes up against him in this case. And the state is secured. It's a brutal story. It's a difficult story. And yet if you think about the way states run today, it's, nothing's changed. It's so much easier to think in terms of the ancient kingdoms in this way. Because they're in the Bible, I tend to think of them sometimes, and maybe you do too, as something other than states. But they are no different than the sovereign states we have today with concerns for commerce and national security, concerns for internal peace, and the running of a civic sort of process in whatever it would be, tax collecting, distributing of information, paving of roads between cities, the building of cities and maintaining of them. These are all concerns that persist to this day. Paul is writing to a young man, and he says, I want you to pay attention to the gospel I've given you. It's of a particular kind. It's something that's really, really precious. And more precious is what you've received within because you received it with the laying on of hands. The gift of God's Spirit has been given you. And I don't want you to forsake that. Let this Spirit of God grow within you. Let it fan the flames of your passion for God and of the Word and of the Gospel and of the message. And take this message that you've been given, this Gospel, and let it grow and let it go. Be the man and be the leader that you're called to be. And by the way, I know all of this is possible because I see the seeds that were planted in you. All of the stuff that makes it possible for you to fulfill what I'm asking of you was given you by two women who loved and feared the Lord. Your mother Eunice and your grandmother Lois. Powerful. Not his father, although I'm sure he was influential too if he was around. Not his grandfather. The women of the house taught Timothy well. His mother educated him in the ways of God and encouraged him. And Paul was able to take that and with the laying on of hands and the gifting of the Spirit, as well as the teachings that he was able to pass on to Paul, to Timothy, to make him also a great disciple of Jesus Christ, an evangelist and a teacher. The Word of God was spread in this way. The kingdom of God was grown in this way. And that which was invisible became visible in this way. Those who had never heard the good news heard the good news. Those who had never received it, received it. And the gift of the Spirit kept replicating and moving and growing throughout the world. It's a great story. It's a great commission, and we can't miss the foundations of that built on motherhood. Mothers, you impact your children spiritually more than you can know. Your love and care and nurture and discipline and strength. I never got to throw anybody's head over a wall. <laughs> but my mother took in another boy for a year who was about my age. And there were territorial issues, as you can imagine, with fifth grade boys. And one day we got into it. And my dear mother just sat and watched. There we were hitting each other, hitting each other, hitting each other. Finally, I got him on the nose and he started to bleed. And that was it for my mother. She said, okay, boys, enough. Bobby, go shower. Greg, go to your room. Wisdom. 
wisdom. She didn't punish either of us. She knew we took care of that for ourselves. She didn't need to beat us up. We knew we had already done that. And she was wise because she knew that there was tension that needed resolution and that we weren't going to do it her way. I praise the wisdom of mothers because I no longer solve problems that way. I outgrew that. I don't even want to solve problems that way. I outgrew that. But because of the love and care and wisdom of my mother, I was able to be a stronger human being, man, and father. Lois and Eunice did their job spiritually for their boy, and he grew up to be God's man. And that's an awesome thing and an awesome responsibility. Our final reading is one of the most interesting and I think heartwarming stories of interaction between Jesus and his mother Mary. Now, don't be too put off by the choice of words in the uh, opening of this story. I remember... uh, that my own dear son uh, had the most vile manner about him if he was woken up prematurely. And I mean vile. I I wondered if he was possessed of another spirit. (laughs) And one day Jill came to him, and I'll never forget this, and she touched him and began to awaken him. And he awoke and fiercely said to her, What do you want with me, woman? (laughs) And I was totally taken aback because... I don't use that kind of language. I don't refer to Jill as woman or my wife as woman. What do you want, woman? And here he, where had he gotten this? Where did it come from? And yes, Brennan, if you're watching, I'll have to give you a dollar. I've used your name in another story. And even though there's inflation, I can't afford the real value of that. Jesus calls his mother woman. Why does he do that? Maybe it's not as harsh in the Hebrew as it is in the English. Maybe it's just kind of a degree of separation he's seeking. Why are you bothering me, Mom, kind of thing? I can't really say. But let's not be too put off by that. Because this is a wonderful, wonderful story of a relationship of a mother and a son. Jesus is at the very, very beginning of his ministry. She knows it's time. Catch that, please. She knows it's time. They're at a wedding. The wine is run out. She has the answer. She knows what needs to be done. She knows it's time. Now, I don't say this haphazardly. I mean knows with a capital K. She knows it's time. And here's how we know that's true. Jesus says, why are you involving me? And then he says, my time has not yet come. And I ask all of you here, if his time had really not yet come, why did he do what she asked? Why? Did he feel the need to obey as a man? Was it just a momentary sort of thing where He said, it's not my time, and then he thought about it a second and said, well, okay, I can do this, or maybe, yes, it is my time. Or maybe it's, mother knows something I don't know. I don't know what the exact answer is, but she says, after after he says this to her, mother, why do you involve me? Or woman, why are you involving me? My time has not yet come. What does she say to the people around Jesus? She says, don't worry about him. Do whatever he tells you. Such a motherly response, totally unflapped by what he said, not concerned at all with whether he's been polite or whether he's honored her appropriately or whether he's done this or that. She's not worried about any of it. She's a great Jewish mother. She knows exactly her son and what he needs and how to handle this situation. She says, just get him whatever he asks. Right? Am, Am I telling the story correctly or no? Yes, she just get him whatever he needs. Now Jesus has to either insist on, no, it's not my time, and sit down, and the party's over, or he has to act. And he tells the servants to go fill the wine jars with water. 
And then he tells them when that task is accomplished, because they're right by the Sea of Galilee, which is really just a large lake, and it's fresh water. He tells them to fill these jars, and then he says, now dip a dipper into the jar and take it to the master of the banquet, which they do. And he sips it, and much to his shock, it is absolutely the best wine of the feast. And he's really put off by this, really put off. Because it was customary to serve the best wine at the beginning of a feast when people could appreciate it most. And so he goes to the bridegroom. He actually goes to the bridegroom and says, what are you thinking? Why did you save the good stuff for now? Why? We're into this feast. We're a long way into this feast. Why are you, why are you just now bringing out the good stuff? Not just wine, but great wine. And the party is saved, and Jesus' ministry is launched, and he performs this miracle in the context of sacred, wedded love. He performs this miracle in the context of a mother who knows it's his time. He performs this miracle in the context of the request of a woman. He performs this miracle at a time of joy and extends the joy. He participates in the culture in which he's found himself. And ultimately, he fulfills the commandment, honor your father and your mother, that your days may indeed be long upon the land that the Lord your God gives you. Sound advice certainly higher advice than I can give. I love this story because of Mary's confidence. I love this story because of her clarity. I love this story because of the way she knows her boy. I love this story because of the way she loves him. I love this story because of the confidence that she feels. I love this story because in her mind, there is no doubt. I love this story because she's prepared to be with him and help him in this very important time of his ministry. I love this story because it's the story of a God who came to be with us and dwell among us and show us the love of the Father. It's so beautiful to me. And so there we have it. By no means a comprehensive survey. But women, I hope that you can hear that in my words and in the words of Scripture, you're strong. You're good looking. And you're way above average. And we love you, and we care for you, and we're so glad that you are us, among us, with us, for us, and that your wisdom and your strength, your guidance and your care, your spirituality, your knowledge, your love gets imparted to us as your children and grandchildren in our Sabbath schools and in the social circumstances of our daily lives here. At this point, it's time to honor our mothers. We have some beautiful flowers over here. I'm going to go get a vase at a time, and when those are exhausted, I'll go get another, and I would just ask that you line up in preparation to share these. We may have enough for every child to give one to their mother, but in the event that that we, that we may have a, a shortfall, we're going to start by asking uh, husbands, if you're here, to please come first and bring a flower to your child, I mean to your, to your, your wife, <laughs> the mother of your children, and if you would rather designate uh, your oldest child to come forward, that's fine too. We may have enough for everybody to do this, but we'll start with just that.
and I got to start here. Good stuff. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and now my favorite part. Do we have any mothers who are here without children or husband today? Would you please stand or raise your... I am no substitute for your children, but I will try. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. I go in and happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. You let me through here. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, and now if you are um, one of several siblings, uh, we have an, a few extras. Please, those of you children who didn't give your mother a rose, please come get one of the remaining roses and take it to your mother. It's just fine if your mother ends up with one, two, three, four of these things. They're beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Why not? One, one rose for every trip to the hospital. That just seems fair to me. Any other mothers who are missing multiples? Well, I, I, Lamar, you have only one over there. I think you have several coming. Happy Mother's Day. Who else is missing? Uh huh. What's that? Of course. <laughs> Ryan. 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 There you go, buddy. Okay. Anybody else? Hmm?
We'll do two here. In fact, she's the organist. She gets four. Mothers, we bless you, and we thank God for you. Let us pray a prayer of blessing. Gracious God, you are both mother and father to us. For male and female, you created us in your image. We're thankful for your divine parenting, and we're thankful for the earthly parenting that we've received as well, and that so many of the women of this congregation remain engaged in. Bless our mothers. Thank you for them. May they walk with you, may they continue to grow in you and learn of you, and may they model for us and teach us the paths in which we should go. We bless Christ, your mother, who so wisely, so many years ago, said, just do what he asks of you. And I can hear that voice in my head today. Perhaps we should all just be doing what Jesus asks of us. So we thank you for the wisdom of mothers and the blessing of them and ask that you in turn bless each of them this day. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you so very much at this time. Freely we've given and so freely, uh, freely we've received and so freely we will give. I'm going to invite our ushers forward to collect our offering at this time. <laughs>